As we recall from Proustiana 12, Marcel Proust and Walter Berry became friends in 1916 when Berry sent Proust a fine 18th century volume stamped with the arms and coronet of Prendre de Guermantes. A descendant of an old and wealthy New York family, Walter Berry was born in Paris, where he spent his early years. He came back to the United States with his parents, attended Harvard, and decided to pursue a career in international law and diplomacy. Prior to returning to France, Berry had served as a judge at the International Tribunal of Egypt from 1908 to 1911. When Proust met him, Berry was 57, handsome and tall, six feet three, with blue eyes that sparkle mischievously. An avid tennis player who was remarkably fit for his age, Berry often rose early in the morning to play matches in the Bois de Boulogne. Writing to a friend, Proust described Berry, who enjoyed fine foods and wine, as a man of refined taste who spends his life in antique shops and, what's more, knows all the rich Americans. Berry, who spoke fluent, eloquent French, was, after the American ambassador, the most influential American in Paris and the most revered. Berry's importance to American business interests was demonstrated when he was elected president of the American Chamber of Commerce in Paris. Berry was a close friend of two famous American expatriates, Henry James and Edith Wharton. Wharton, who lived most of her adult life in France, called Berry the love of her life. During the war years, Berry and Wharton toured the battlefields as part of their campaign to assist the French. Edith made important contributions to relief work by setting up a number of charities in France, while Berry lobbied hard to bring the United States into the war which finally happened in April 1917. Barry's ready wit and endless supply of charm and kindness enchanted Proust. When Proust began dining at the Hotel Ritz several times a week, he and Barry saw each other fairly often. One evening, Barry invited Proust to his apartment to see the rare Indian and Chinese objets d'art acquired during Barry's voyages and Egyptian stay. The visit revived Proust's nostalgia for the ancient past and made him dream of traveling to far-off places. Barry was so knowledgeable about prehistoric art that he was invited to Barcelona at the opening of the French Salon to give a lecture on what he called Mediterranean art, or prehistoric cave paintings. Barry delivered his essay in French and later loaned the manuscript to Proust, who expressed his opinion to a friend. I received Monsieur Walter Barry's lecture, which literally dazzled me with the revelation of that unsuspected race of men emulating Michelangelo 50,000 years before Christ. It's astonishing that an American jurist should write so admirably in French. Who would not be proud to have written that? In early January 1918, Proust went out late at night to take a stroll in the snow. As he walked, often slipping on the ice, two American soldiers approached him and asked for directions to the Hotel Bedford. Proust related the incident in a letter to Barry. Since the soldiers spoke little French, and Proust had forgotten his English, the three men set out silently looking for the hotel, which they soon found. Proust had been moved at the thought of how far from home the two soldiers had come. He lamented the ever-rising number of war casualties, and observed that those the war did not kill, it ruined financially. But he believed an end to the fighting was more likely now due to the arrival of the American forces the previous year. Proust told Barry that it was thanks to his efforts that the United States had entered the war. In September 1918, Proust wrote to congratulate Barry for being awarded the Légion d'honneur, France's recognition of Barry's services during the war years. In early January 1919, on returning home from a dinner at the Ritz, Proust found a letter from his aunt, Amélie Veille, informing him that she had sold 102 Boulevard Hospin to a banker who intended to convert the building into a bank and offices. The news devastated Proust, who found it incredible that his aunt had said nothing to him about the possibility of selling the property. Since he had no lease, only a verbal understanding with his aunt, Proust feared the new owner might evict him while demanding immediate payment of the approximately 25,000 francs he owed for past due rent, a debt that he had been unable to pay because most of his investments and funds were frozen during the war years. 
Rather than finding out what his rights were, Proust stepped up the efforts to sell furniture and tapestries. Proust wrote immediately to Barry to explain the disaster that had befallen him and to solicit his aid in selling furnishings. Would Barry be willing to receive and show at the American Chamber of Commerce two large green swords tapestries, an antique oriental rug, a magnificent antique easy chair, sconces, and an antique settee? Barry agreed to display the items, but they would find no buyer. Eager to do his part in honoring Barry for his service to France during the war, Proust asked if he would accept the dedication of Pastiche and Mélange, or the Guermant way. Pastiche et Mélange, a collection of parodies and essays originally published in Le Figaro, would have the advantage of appearing sooner in print. In one way it would give me greater pleasure to dedicate Le Côté de Guermant to you, because it was through the Guermant that we met. But Pastiche et Mélange also has its advantages, in that I can testify to my gratitude and admiration for you all the sooner. It's for you to choose, always supposing that you would like to have a book of mine dedicated to you. Barry replied that he was deeply moved by Proust's intention to dedicate a book to him, and said it must surely be the Guermont way, since that name Guermont had brought them together. But Proust made the choice and sent Barry a copy of the dedication for his approval. He had decided not to wait for publication of the Guermont way, at least a year away. The dedication of Pastiche et Mélange, due out that spring, read, To Monsieur Walter Berry, lawyer and man of letters, who from the first day of the war pleaded France's cause before a still undecided America, and with incomparable energy and talent, won his case, his friend, Marcel Proust. Proust later told Berry that he considered him the victor in the greatest war of all the wars. The delighted Barry replied that Proust was Madame Grandeur for me. I'll expect to end up in the Pantheon. When it was announced in the fall of 1920 that Marcel Proust, a man of letters, was to receive the Légion d'honneur, Proust received a new stack of congratulatory letters. Henri Berson wrote his dear cousin that within a budding grove was the worthy continuation of Swan's Way. Rarely has introspection been carried so far. It's a direct and continuous vision of inner reality. Artist Paul Eleur, about to embark for New York, conveyed his congratulations and said that he had always wanted to do an etching of Proust's head, but you never come to see me anymore. From his vacation spot at Le Piquet near Bordeaux, Jean Cocteau sent a brief message. On you, the red ribbon has meaning. I embrace you. As usual, Walter Berry managed to be charming and witty. Having noticed that Édouard Branly was to receive the Légion d'honneur in the same group as Proust, Berry wrote, I have learned that the government has brought honor on itself by decorating two great Frenchmen, the only truly modern novelist and the inventor of the radio, Branly. Basically, you both practice the same trade, but I much prefer your waves. On December 8, 1921, Proust wrote Barry, telling him that, after seven months in bed, he had gone to the Ritz at midnight, where he had asked the head waiter, the good Olivier, if he could dine. In a sentimental mood, after downing a bottle of Porto 345, Proust had thought how pleasant it was when I used to come here with Monsieur Walter Barry, and I asked myself, am I past the time for loving? La Fontaine, without a hint of Charlus. How I long to see you again. Proust went on to say that the bottle of Ritz Port, then 345, had made him only slightly tipsy, but Barry should not ascribe his tender effusion solely to the 345. Is there no way before dying, I'm talking about me, to see each other again, to tell each other those things whose seeds will perhaps sprout in eternity? Then Proust recalled an amusing letter he had recently received from an American woman living in Rome and whose name he had already forgotten. After assuring him that she was very beautiful at 27, she confessed that for three years she had done nothing night and day except read his books. That sounded fine until he reached the end of her letter, which was mortifying, because a woman expressed her utter perplexity. 
And after three years of reading you nonstop, I've come to the conclusion that I understand nothing, but absolutely nothing. Dear Marcel Proust, don't be a poseur. Come down from your ivory tower for once. Tell me in two lines what you're trying to say. That being something she hadn't managed to understand or I to explain in 2,000 lines, I decided it was pointless to answer her. In his reply, Barry expressed his eagerness to see his old friend, and knowing that Proust always sent Celeste Alvare to a nearby cafe to make his phone calls, suggested, But now if you go out, even if it's at 11 o'clock at night, why not have me Celeste phoned and we can share a bottle of the 345? Regarding the American lady, Barry had this to say, The other day when an American woman, the image of yours in Rome, Yes, I'm bound to know her, for I've met hundreds like her. Asked me if I liked your books. I replied, yes, but they have one serious fault. They're far too short. And the woman fled, speechless. I might have added that they have an even more serious fault. Having read them, one can no longer read a book by anybody else.